13 and in verse 13 in the Amplified it says and now there remain faith abiding trust in God and his promises hope confident expectation of eternal salvation love unselfish love for others growing out of God's love for me these three the choices graces but the greatest of these is love so father we just thank you for this morning thank you for this day that you have made we shall rejoice and be glad in it we give thanks and praise for your love the greatest gift the things that you have done you have died on the cross for us. You have done things that no one else can do. And so we bless you. We honor you. We give you our worship. We give you our praise. We give you our thanks. We give you glory. We give you honor. All that is due unto you, we give it to you. We thank you, God, for the things that you have done, the ways that you have made, making the impossible to be possible. Lord, we just honor you, bless you for moving mountains, for changing our thoughts and for uh, not conforming to the world but the things of you yes, to just be present in this place and with you always just how your word illuminates and give, brings life to our souls we just honor you thank you for being the greatest that there ever was the greatest that has ever lived the greatest that has ever won any victories, every victory, your train filling the temple. We honor you. We bless you on this morning for being who you are and doing only the things that you can do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And then I always say everything in between. So we give him thanks and we worship him.
sing the last song. My mind went back to um, when I was uh, growing up in church, and um, they kept the beat by the clapping of the hands and the stumping of their feet. And uh, some people might not remember that, but yeah. but it just it took me back. And as I listened to the song, I just had a, um, I was reminiscing and just smiling on. It doesn't take much for us to give God praise. We don't need much to give God praise. But the very fact that I'm breathing right now is more than enough Amen. to say, Lord, I thank you for this day. Amen. 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 I mean, it doesn't need to be, and sometimes we think because when we like we share, it needs to be something big and something like miraculous has just happened. I got all my family here. I'm happy. It's a good day. It's enough to thank the God, thank our, our Heavenly Father for, amen? Amen. It's, don't um, was, I despise the little things. They're so important. Those, and they, and it's, it's hard to even say little things. They're, usually, they're big things. I can breathe. I can move out. I can exhale, inhale. Man, I'm thankful. I'm, I'm, the old saying should be say, um, clothed in my right mind. I'm so thankful that I'm clothed in my right mind. I'm so thankful that God has blessed me and kept me to this day. I'm so Thank thankful. You, he is Amen. so good. Do I have another person in the room that's thankful today? Yeah. Yeah. I have another person that's thankful to God. Start the way. Amen. This is now we're going to have um, Senior Pastor um, come forward with the message. Amen? Amen. I'm just messing with you. I think we're good. We're good like your reposition. Like, sis, we got to be good. So we're going to be good. I have several things that I want to um, perhaps address. And so... Maybe we'll get we'll get to most of them. I, I pray. I hope. Um, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's let's. Um, um, my my grandfather would would get up and sing this song on pretty regularly. He would, it would the words of the song say, "I give thanks unto the Lord for His goodness to me," yes. and, and and it would refrain. I give thanks unto the Lord for His goodness to me, for His mercies endure forever. I give thanks, I give thanks, I give thanks. Any thankful people in the house? Amen. Amen. I give thanks unto the Lord for his goodness to me. God, he is good. He, he is great. And as a result of his greatness, it puts him in a position where he is greatly, the scripture says, to be praised. And so we, we, um, we want to give him praise. We want to give him honor and glory for all um, for, for who he is. I, I'm, I'm grateful for who the Lord is to me Amen. and who he is in my life and, and um, uh, what he's doing even though 99.9% of the time I started to make it like I was smart to say 98% of the time 98% <laughs> of the time I don't know what God is doing but truly 99.9% .9 of the time I don't know what God is doing Amen. Amen. And I don't care how smart you think you are or the people who are talking to you tell you they are. They don't know either. They don't know either. We are on a need-to-know basis as it relates to God. We walk by faith, not by knowledge. And I mess with you a little bit. Can I mess with you a little bit? I know we're smart. But we don't walk by knowledge. We walk by faith. Amen. Are you here? Amen. Now, now, it is my faith walk that's bringing me to a place called knowing, where I get to know him. And what it is that I come to know more and more about him is I can't predict his next move. Amen. Which brings me right back to the place of having to walk with him by what? Faith. 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 Are you, oh, Lord. Does this make any sense? Yes, sir. I hope it makes sense. I hope it's not nonsense to you. And uh, you know, we we are we are we are 
We are finite. We are finite. Amen. And so there is no way, no way that you can predict the next move of, of the one who is infinite. Amen. There's no way. So it's like a lump of clay being put on the wheel, and before the potter even touches it, the clay says, I'm going to be a bowl. <laughs> you have no idea. You a lump of clay. First of all, you ain't got to been to say nothing. <laughs> yeah, you're going to say it again. Amen. You know you ain't going to stand for no talking clay. <laughs> right? You have no business saying anything because we don't know. We don't know. It, it is totally and completely left to the discretion of the potter. Yes. And then it, all that's left for us is a yes and an amen. 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 Right? And just a full, a full faith and obedience in God. And so I, I am, that's really critical. What did I start by saying? Where, how did I get there? This is going to be a rabid day. I can feel it. I just chase the rabbit. I don't even know what I was talking about. But, but anyway, I'm, I'm learning more and more to trust God, and I'm learning less and less that I, that I can predict his next move, Amen. that I can predict his next step. Amen. I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to understand more and more um, that, that I do not know that the, the next command or the set of instructions from the Lord will, will lead me to the left or to the right. In, in fact, in fact, um, one of the things that, you know, when God, you ever, you ever sense God ask you a question? You ever feel God in your heart asking you a question? It is not because God needs you to inform him. Right? He is all-knowing. When God asked me, it was strange this week. I was sitting, I was sitting in a gathering, and um, I wasn't on my phone. I wasn't, I wasn't distracted. You know how you can be someplace, and you can be distracted? Amen. And I got to tell you, our phones are the greatest distraction we have. Amen. Our phones are the greatest. Our, if I'm not careful, my phone can keep me from being with my children and my grandchildren. We can all be in the same room, but we're not engaged. Yes, sir. If I'm not careful, my phone can keep me from being engaged with my wife. My phone can keep me from... Yeah, we don't like it. It's okay. I am not ready to please you. Because ain't never one of y'all call me to ministry. So you want to be made happy, go someplace else. You want to hear the truth? Hold on to your seat. I got some for you. Right, that, it's a it's a huge. I've been in meetings. I mean, high level kingdom meetings. Mm -hmm. wow. But it just says that it's not as high a level and priority to you mm -hmm. as you say. So you should excuse yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. I, 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 we have to be careful that I listen. Mm, uh, I, I want to be sure. I want to be sure that my engagement levels are, are consistent and congruent. And you cannot tell me that you are super engaged to God and you can't be engaged to me. That's true. That's true. That's true. Because I'm here. You can see me. You can touch me. You can hear me. Right? We can, we can exchange in the earthly realm. Right? Our five senses. Our five senses are what connects us to the earth. And so we have that. We can do that. And then now you're telling me you, you can't engage me. But him who you've never seen, never touched, never smelled. Come on. You've not engaged him with your senses like that. Uh, you so engaged with him. There's something. That's out of order. That's not my supposition on it. The scripture bears that. And so I, I, I want to be engaged with you when I, when I have an opportunity. And you all want to be engaged with me when you have an opportunity. Right? And remember now, remember Romans 1, uh, 10 or 11, whatever it is from the Passion Translation. When we engage that way, when we are face to face, when we are side to side, there's co-encouragement. Come on, there's cold comfort. It's, it goes both ways. Look, somebody told me this goes both ways. And if it ain't flowing both ways, it's broken 
and it needs to be healed. Yes. Are you? So I'm in this, I'm in this, this setting, and I, my phone is, is face down on, on another book, so in case it vibrated, it wouldn't reverberate through the whole room, and, and, and I'm, I'm not on my phone. God engages me with this, this question. I've got a lot of time. It's good, it's good. He engages me. And he's, I felt like in my heart, I didn't hear, boo. I didn't hear that. But in my heart, I felt like the Lord was asking me, how do you feel about your salvation? How do you feel about being saved? How do you feel about being saved? Okay, let me ask you that question. How do you feel about being saved? Great. Great? Great. Say it blessed. blessed. Wonderful. Grateful. Grateful. It's great. That's right. right. You, you know what my first response was? I ain't going to hell. <laughs> yeah, you would think, you would listen. Y'all laughing at me. But that was going to be on your list. If you had a went down your list, that was going to be the same man. You know it was going to be on your list. Child, I ain't got to spend eternity in hell. <laughs> that was really, I'm not ashamed to say, but it was really my first I ain't going to a devil's hell. <laughs> Listen, and look, say for nobody. for nobody. I ain't going to a devil's hell for nobody. Not for me, surely not for you. I ain't going. I ain't going. Salvation does that for me. And so now remember, I know what I started. You know, when God asks you a question, it's not because he wants to know or needs to know. Typically, when he asks me a question, I need to know something. I need to know. When God asks you a question, you need to know. It's not like he's coming to you because you're brilliant and you have all the answers. That's not it. You need to know something. And so, typically, if it's not that God needs to know something, and I do, what is it that he needs to know? Now, I've just kind of been meditating on this all week. And then finally, what's the day? Sunday. So it had to be Friday, I believe. I felt like the Lord said, what you need to know is your 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 heart disposition. You need to know the disposition of your heart. By definition, disposition, working man's definition, is the inherent quality of one's state of mind or character. You need to know what's going on in your heart, in your mind, in your heart, in your character. You need to know. You need to know your disposition. You need to know your heart disposition. And God challenged me now and said, you are not just saved so you don't go to hell. Mm -hmm. Amen. Are you here? Yes. Amen. Are you here? Now I'm grateful. It's wonderful to be saved. All of those, all of those great adjectives that we use are, are marvelous. But, but look, just gently remind somebody that you're saved for more than that. <laughs> Go on, say it to them. Don't be afraid of them. Say it. Say them. Say it. Go on. Oh, John, now give it back to her. Don't let her get away with that. You, you're safe for more. You're safe for more than that. Right? Right? And so it's this disposition. And then I thought about, y'all remember Ezekiel now? I, I'm traveling. We got time. We got time. So in Ezekiel 37, this is not a mental stream. This really is a spiritual stream. Let me stream spiritually. So in Ezekiel 37, remember God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? Y'all remember that question in the scripture? Well, what, what did Ezekiel say? He said, Ezekiel said, listen, I don't know nothing. Can I paraphrase it? I don't know nothing. You know everything. Lord, you know. Lord, you know. You see the disposition. Do you see his heart disposition? Do you see the disposition of Ezekiel's heart? Ezekiel, Ezekiel, by this time when you read, when you read uh, the prophet's account, you know, he has served as a priest, then God called him to prophecy, then God sends him down to the river Chabar so that he can live there with the exiles. Ezekiel 3.15, Ezekiel says, I sat where they sat. It's hard to minister to people and you don't know where they're coming from. Amen. Hard to minister to people whom you can't identify with. You're preaching, Bill. This is good. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. And so Ezekiel said, I sat where they sat. And then God, 
God didn't just use Ezekiel. Like Ezekiel would get a word from the Lord and then he'd get up in the morning, wash his face, go out to the, to the children of Israel and say, Thus saith the Lord, yea, I say unto thee, thou captivity shall continue. No, Ezekiel had to do these strange things. He had to lay on one side for a period of time, weeks. He laid on one side. Then God said, okay, now turn over and lay on the other side. It was just this crazy. Can I say, I mean crazy good. <laughs> when, you, when you use crazy in the context of God, it's never bad, right? It's crazy good. <laughs> he, this, this, this series of things that God would put Ezekiel through and cause him to do to paint a picture both for Ezekiel and for Israel. By now, Israel is, uh, Ezekiel is caught up in a vision. He finds himself in a valley of dry bones. I ain't even preaching about Ezekiel. This is just an example. Everybody say the disposition of my heart. God wants to reveal, say it, the disposition of my heart. And listen, and now, oh Lord, let me, let me finish Ezekiel. So he asked Ezekiel this question. Who is standing in the midst of this valley full of dry bones? And then this crazy question. Can these bones live? Can they live? And Ezekiel could have pronounced, I mean, listen, based on what he knew, based on what he saw, based on Israel's track record, based on the fact that he was standing in a valley full of dry, disconnected bones, What's your answer? Hey, no, these bones came. <laughs> but the disposition of Ezekiel's heart caused him not to judge a thing based on what he saw. Let me ask you this. What are you judging based on what you see? We got relationship issues because we judge based on what we see. We can't get along based on what we hear. Ain't got nothing to do with God. It's just, that got my back up. I can't believe they said that to me. Well, they said it. Now what are you going to do? <sighs> Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Y'all say amen. 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 In the morning, say amen. Yeah, right. I know I'm telling the truth. We get so bent out of shape over nothing. Say nothing. 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 If the disposition of your heart was better, you could shake it off and keep moving. What are you carrying that you should have shaken off? When it comes to the disposition, I'm almost ready to call a text and start preaching. Almost. When it comes to the disposition of my heart, one of the things the Lord reminded me, uh, you know, God, he's, God, the Lord said, guard your gates. Guard your gates. Guard your gates. You, you, yo, can I? Ooh. You have no idea how many people among us are living life out of somebody else's hurt. Mm. Mm. You have no idea how many among us are mad out of somebody else's anger. In yours. They're mad, so you mad. How are you mad? Because you let them seed your mind. You let them seed your heart. Disposition. The inherent quality. The inherent, inherent, that which is internal. Inherent, that which is internal. Inherent that which is internal, the internal quality or state or of readiness, of soundness of your mind and your character. And if you give your mind to the wrong seed, you will have the wrong plant growing in your mind. If you give your heart or your character to the wrong seed, you'll have the wrong thing growing in the garden of your life. Uh -huh, I am preaching better than you're saying amen. amen. Everybody don't get to see my thinking. Right. Some conversations start and I stop them. Amen. Mm. When you... 
Yeah, I guess I will ask, ask, ask that question. When you going to adopt the good sense to stop people from filling you with garbage? Well, I'm just trying to be a good friend and a sounding board. The devil is a liar. If you are a good friend, you'll correct that with what the word says. You don't co-sign it, you correct it. <sighs> you ready? You good? I'm here all week. Come see me. <laughs> ain't running, ain't scared, ain't hiding, ain't going out of town. Let's talk. Everybody don't get to say everything to me. And they shouldn't to you. Amen. You all right? Amen. Stop being a dumping place for people. Now, folks, you ain't never had a problem with, you got a problem with them. And it ain't even your problem. You living out of somebody else's problem. To, to, to me, to me, I'm going to tell you how that sounds. Just to me, that's so stupid. For the sake of our time together, stupid is a theological term. We're going to use it freely during the course of this discourse. That's dumb. We allow people to affect our disposition. And then when God asks you the question, we can't give him the proper answer. And for Ezekiel, see Ezekiel, there are two answers that are so dynamic in scripture. The best two answers of anybody who is asked a question by God come from Abraham and Ezekiel. I, I'm going, I'm going. We could, could get your Bible, let's check it out. I'll go with you. I will look at them all. But Abraham, Genesis 22, I believe it is, he says, Inani, here I am. Whatever you want. Whatever you say. In fact, Abraham, when Abraham's answer, I've got this wonderful Hebraist friend, and he says, when God called him, Abram, Abraham, and Abraham, he, he opened up his checkbook, he signed Abraham of the Chaldeans, Abraham, the guy who's being changed, I don't know how he signed it, he signed it, ripped out the check, and gave it to God. Blank check. Who would you give a blank check to? Only, only God, he bought the only one. And I'm going into a serious prayer meeting after I give it to him. <laughs> oh, don't go be the last. Come on, help me. I'm not going into it. Yeah, only one. But that's, the, that's akin to Hanani. Abram says, Hanani, here I am. Whatever you say, whatever you want. And then you know God's ask. And we know the degree of Abraham's obedience. Abraham and Ezekiel. These are the two best answers that you will ever find in scripture. Ezekiel says, I don't know, but you know. I'm riding with you. That's Ezekiel's answer. I don't, Ezekiel, can these bones live? I don't know. What if they gonna do whatever you say they, <laughs> they gonna do, so I'm with you. I don't know, Lord, you know. Lord, you know. Stop pretending to know. You don't. Be offended. Sometimes offense is good because it causes me to be confronted with me. We are looking for confrontation with other people. Your greatest confrontation needs to happen with you. Are you, you okay? Is this too much for you? I, I hope it's not because I'm going still. I'm keep going. I'm keep going. I ain't done. We all right? He just says, I don't know. You know. And God says, good answer. Now, based on what you don't know, and based on what I do know, prophesy to these bones. See, the instruction, you'll never get the instruction until you get the answer right. You'll, you'll never get the instruction until you get the answer right. That, that, was, the, that was the thing. If, if Ezekiel had said, oh, that's all these bones dry and dead, they, they, they're crusty and dusty. And they, this, the desert is barren, it's bleak. There ain't no life here. Then God would have had to do another thing altogether in Ezekiel before he could get to where Ezekiel could prophesy to what looked dead to 
see him. God is not interested in how you see it. He wants you to see it the way he sees it. Are you? Are we all right? We spend too much time telling God how we see it. We spend too much time telling God how we feel about it. That ain't the issue. The issue is God is saying, what have I said about it? And why aren't your words and your heart attitude in alignment to what I've said about it? David's prayer, right? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. Yeah. Okay, we good? Um, Jay, can you reduce the volume on that just a little bit? So, so how do you feel about your salvation? Where, where, where are you at with your salvation? And I, I literally, I said to the Lord, I sure ain't going to hell. And the Lord said, that's good, you're right. But there's so much more than that. So much more. Let's look at some passages of scripture now. In case you, you, you think I'm not going to use any. Said, All those scriptures I just used. But anyway. <laughs> anyway. Now I didn't write my, my passages down. So, who's got a, um, okay, who's got a, uh, we're going we're gonna, to, we're gonna, Pastor Craig, do you remember um, the old school, when you had a reader? <laughs> I start reading, preacher said, preacher said, read. <laughs> when you get to a verse or something, preacher said, read. <laughs> I need, a, I need a reader. I didn't put my I didn't put my passages in my notes. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. We know this one very well. Let's track a word here right quick. quick just a quick, a brief word study. And not even in full. We, we are familiar with this word. John 3, 16. Who's got a um let's do anybody have a new King James? Okay. Okay, so we have a new King James in the house. Um, and um, Tab, do you have I, you was, you gave a three point sermon? The only thing it missed was a poem and a prayer um, from the Passion. I, I love you. <laughs> y'all notice that people just be getting up and sneak preaching during time of sharing? Have y'all? And Jay is pointing to someone, maybe not Tab, but certainly in that general direction. And Pastor George and Andrea will have to do some marriage counseling with them at the close of service because Jay ratted her out. Um, you have the passion tab. So these passages, would you find those in the passion and then and then we'll read them. Okay, New King James, John 3, 16 and 17. In your um, Aaliyah, use the voice that you use when the kids about to meet their maker. <laughs> That ain't it. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That the world through him might be saved. That word in the Greek, sozo, S-O-Z-O, sozo. There's so many things that have been done with this definition, with the definition of the Greek word sozo. But it, 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 means, it means to cause someone to experience divine salvation. Right? Uh, you could be standing on, on, on train tracks or something and I come along and I pull you away in the nick of time. I saved you, but that's not divine because I'm not God. Say amen to that. Divine, sozo, sozo is God stepping down into the midst of your calamity and doing for you what no one else could do. That's sozo. That's saved. Right? That's saved. Right? For God so loved the world, verse 16, it really explains sozo. God so loved. So is a verb. It means, it means that love, not only, like you, love is not a feeling. And I shouldn't say it's not. Because you certainly feel a certain way. But look at somebody tell them say it's more than a feeling. It's more than a feeling. See, if you're married and your mate is here, you should be making eye contact. 
Gentlemen, it's more than fair. If you're a parent and your children are in the room, then you should be making eye contact to them. Aaliyah and I say, put your hands on them now. There she go. She's about to choke them out. There's a feeling. This is, a, this is a life leaving your body. No. It's, 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 more than, it's more than a feeling, right? We talked about it some weeks ago. That love looks like something. And when we say love looks like something, it means it acts like that love takes on action. Love does. Love produces something. Right? Love, love is, it is quantifiable. Amen. You can. You should be able to count on it. Mm -hmm. Count on the fact that if I do wrong, that love will forgive me. Amen. Love won't keep score. Y'all going to make me read Corinthians 13? I'll read it if I have to. Yeah, it won't, it won't keep score. It won't, love won't hold a grudge. Look at somebody and tell them, say, love looks like something. That, that means love acts like something. And John 3, 16 said, God's love, the verb, acted like this. He sent his son to sozo me. It was God's divine intervention to save us to rescue us, and not just from hell. Yay, from hell, but not just hell. See, mm, salvation is more than fire insurance. That's my subject. More than fire insurance. And more than fire insurance. Say that with me. More. Can you use your laptop so voice? Come on, let's start again. More than fire. Okay, can we, can, who's got the passion? Tab, do you have that in the passion? Yes. Can I, an outside voice now, outside voice. You know the one. For he is the way God loved the, for here is the way God loved the world. He gave his only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its savior and rescue it. That's good. To be his, its savior and rescue it. 1 Corinthians 1.21. 1 121. We're going to encounter this word sozo again. 1 Corinthians 121. New King James reader, read. No, I mean, okay, no, I'm sorry. You're reading a little bit fast. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let, let, let us let us know when you have it, yeah. Because sometimes these devices are slow. Remember back in the church when the preacher would call a text, all you could hear was pages. Now now you hear nothing. You you look and you see the reflection of the light from the device on people's face. That's not the glory of the Lord. That's their device that has illuminated their face. Okay, are you are you there? You, you're illuminated. You're illuminated, sis. Go ahead. Go ahead. First Corinthians. 121. For since in the wisdom, excuse me, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Save those who believe. Same word, sozo. And in the, in the New King James, it talks about wisdom. In other paraphrases or translations, it'll talk about knowledge, like the knowledge of man. And then, listen, your knowledge will ever bring you to know him. Your knowledge will never, ever bring you to know him. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care about your IQ, your EQ, your SQ. Your, you know, I don't care about that. I don't care about your intellectual quotient, your emotional quotient, or your spiritual quotient. It will never bring you to knowing God. Never. You are not that smart. I am not that smart. All of us put together are not that smart. It's not. It is through faith in the preached word of the gospel. The euangelion. That's the Greek word for the preaching, the proclamation of the gospel. What is that message? That Jesus was prophesied eons before he came. That Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, would come and he would save the world from their sins. Isaiah prophesied that in Bethlehem and Jewry, a baby would be born. And it would be this inconspicuous birth. But he would be the savior of the world. One prophet after another prophet after another prophet after another prophet. The whole book is crystal 
or Christ centered. Everything points to Jesus. It is faith in that message. Faith in the one who the message points to that brings salvation. And then it opens the door to knowledge. It opens the door to knowing him. But Paul says to folks who were pretty smart, your wisdom could not bring this out. Your wisdom could not bring you to God. It's God's, his love and his kindness that brings himself to us. Are you here? Do you understand? Do you have it in the, in the okay, come on, come on, come on. Well, quick now, y'all take it too long. We got to go faster. For in his wisdom, God designed that all the world's wisdom would be insufficient. All of the, wait a minute, all of the world's wisdom, all of the world's wisdom, wisdom past, wisdom present, wisdom future, right? We're going to, you know, you can take a day trip to space. A day trip in a reusable rocket. You can go, flow in space, and come on back. It don't even take a whole day. And the big brain people are working on sending you to Mars. <laughs> Y'all can go. I'm going to occupy till he comes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you get it. Wisdom past, wisdom present, wisdom future couldn't do this. Yes, ma'am. Read, read, read. God designed that all the world's wisdom would be insufficient to lead people to the discovery of himself. He took great delight in baffling the wisdom of the world by using the simplicity of preaching the story of the cross in order to save those who believe. It's this deal. We got to be careful if you're really smart, because the Bible says here that, that the writer here says, uh, Dr. Simmons says that, that God took great delight mm -hmm. in baffling the wise. Wow. Gotta be careful. Did you catch that? Yeah. That God takes great delight hey. in baffling the wise. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm smart enough to know I'm a big dummy, hey, and I need is. faith in Jesus. I'm smart enough to know that. Yeah, I, I, it requires faith in him. La last passage, last passage on the word sozo is still there. Ephesians 2 5. And then we're gonna jump from here and, and we're gonna go, we're gonna go at supersonic speed so we can we can get finished. But y'all put me up early. I don't know what you expected that I was gonna do, but use up all this extra time. So I blame you. Ephesians 2 and 5, very familiar. Are you are you there? Are you there? Yes. Okay, loud reader, come on. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made which excuse me. Even when we were dead in tra trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. By grace, when we were dead, he made us. He made us together alive with him. And Paul says, this is Paul here, but in his letter to the Romans 8, 11, Paul says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells where? In us. Come on, same spirit. Everybody say same spirit. Same spirit. Say same anointing. We're going to come back to that. Hold that phrase, same anointing. Same anointing. Look at salvation is more than fire insurance. Listen, I'm not worried about going to hell. I'm not going. See, you can be so worried about how to stay out of hell until you miss the assignment. Staying out of hell is not the assignment. Jesus came to fix that. Mm. That's good. You, are you okay? That's a done deal. Oh, I got it. It, it, What's the song say? If you live, my mama would sing it all the time. If you live right, heaven belongs to you. If you live right, heaven belongs to you. If you live right, heaven belongs to you. Oh, heaven belongs to you. And then it's like, treat my neighbor right. Treat my coworker right. Treat my fellow church member right. You ain't going to say amen. amen. <laughs> I ain't going to bump nobody's car out the parking lot and not get out and go tell them I hit your car. <laughs> That's happened. <laughs> I'm not going to find a $50 bill in the parking lot and jump and shout and say the Lord bless me. 
Maybe one of my brothers or sisters in the church dropped their money. <laughs> Is that too much truth for you? Are we okay? Is that too much? See, see, if we don't get it out of the heavenlies and make it really practical, we're going to keep on missing it. We're going to keep on missing it. So I'm going to live right. I'm, I'm living right. The, Jesus positioned us so that we could, we could live right. You have everything you need. The Bible says that God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You have everything you need. Now, when you don't do, it's just because you disobeyed. You just chose not to do. With all of the tools, with all of the equipment, with everything you need to do the right thing, you set all of that aside so you could do the opposite. Amen. We have to progress beyond the revelation of being sinners saved by grace. That's all we are. Sinners saved by grace. That's what I am. I am a sinner saved by grace. And it, that's, it's, you got to admit that. You have to know that. But you don't stay there. You don't, you don't, you don't build... <clears throat> This doctrinal cathedral on that point. Okay, now that that's been established, now that that's been done, then I recognize that also as a part of my salvation, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him, through him, and by him, we might be the righteousness of God. The righteous, so now my verbiage has to change. Now, I, I, listen, I can't keep referring to myself as a sinner saved by grace. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. See, if you don't change your verbiage, you, you'll, you can't change your actions. See, see <clears throat> action don't, doesn't change until the mind changes. Back to the original question. Why does God ask us what he asks us? So he can show us the disposition of our heart. The inherent quality of both my mind and my character. I need to see that my mind has to change. Until my mind changes, I can't consistently change my behavior. I can modify it for a period of time. But I can't change it. And so... Paul says that we have to be transformed by what? Renewing by the renewing of the mind. Because it is when the mind changes that behavior changes. By the power of the living Christ. It happens. It changes. And so, sinners saved by grace? Absolutely. But I can't, you, won't, you, won't, you won't hear me stay there. I can't say that. You can't stay there. Yes, sinners saved by grace. But I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's true. This is no less true. And it is from this point that we step into assignment. It's hard to step into assignment from here. Because we'll, we'll always say, I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm not educated. My clothes don't fit. I'm too dark. I, I'm too light. I'm too skinny. I'm too fat. I'm too tall. I'm too short. It's always something. Look at somebody tell them, say, it's always something. It's always something. You, ask them, say, why? Ask them, if they can say, why? Look back and tell them, say, because you ain't perfect. I, I use bad English on purpose. It's always something. Always, always. But it's no longer about you. That's why Paul said, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it is not I, but Christ that lives. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I can live in a victorious place in my imperfect flesh. Amen. Where I can stand up before.
before you. And it don't matter how I look. What matters is what I'm saying for him. And if you fixate on the wrong thing, you'll miss the important thing. And so it doesn't matter. I have one church that we, we, uh, we minister at a lot. It was one of these modern, newfangled places. And, um, you know, the, everything is, is on the platform, on the stage. It's just black. It's dark. It's, it, the, the, back, the background is black. And uh, yeah, that's the new thing. And uh, it's just all black. And they have these bright lights. And, and so you look out, you can't see. I'm telling you, you can't see a soul out there. I, I tell people, breathe hard, so I know you're there. I mean, you know, just, and, and you can't see anything, and it's super dark, and I'm super dark. Say so, amen. I prefer chocolatey. Not, 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 chocolatey. Is, yeah, what color are you? Chocolatey, okay? And so, and so, you know, it's the lighting and the dark backdrop. And so I know, okay, when I go there, I got to try to, I got to wear brighter clothes. And, uh, you know, you'll be thinking about, y'all don't think about that stuff. Okay, wait till you get on the platform somewhere. You go, <laughs> I'm telling you, some of this stuff going to cross your mind. It's going to run through the field of your mind. And I'm thinking, man. You know, you, you think about all that stuff, but you know the bottom line is none of that matters. Amen. None of that matters because life comes from the word of God, yes. not the messenger. Amen. It's what the messenger carries. It's not the messenger. And when the messenger gets themselves jammed up, then a jackass and a rooster. See, we think we're so important in the economy of the kingdom. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It, it was the rooster crowing. And at the moment of the crowing, conviction, conviction set in on Peter. It was the donkey that just uh, out of nowhere began to talk to the prophet. Haven't I served you? Haven't I done right by you? You're beating on me, and I'm trying to save your full life. You and you, I mean, this, this is the thing you're going to beat on me. See, when the messenger get jammed up, that's okay. God's going to get his message across. Amen. See, I'm, I'm, this is. Here we go. You ready? The purpose of salvation is to bring us back into a family relationship with God. It's to bring us back into a family relationship with God. Somebody, I'm, I'm New King James, John chapter 1 verse 12. The family relationship with God. I am a son of God. We are sons and daughters. See, if you hang out as sinner saved by grace, you'll miss righteousness and you'll miss your relational position with God, son and daughter. Sinners saved by grace don't sound nothing like sons and daughters. Amen. Nothing like it. I'm not saying this one is wrong. We are absolutely that. But we, God, by his grace, moves us in our relational position with him. And he brings us to a place where we begin to understand that we are sons and daughters. St. John, St. John 1, 12, maybe verse 11 says he came to his own and his own received them not, but to as many as received him. To them gave he power to become what? The sons of God. Is that what it says? Yes. Some close. Children of God. Children of God. Chil family. Let me see somebody say family. Amen. Children of God. Sons and daughters. Sons and daughters. That's different than sinners saved by grace now. Let me ask you this. When will you graduate in your relationship with God? You good? Okay. Let's, let's close. Let's close. Let's go. Are you ready? Ephesians. No, yeah, look, look up Ephesians 2 and 10. 2 and 10. It's familiar. We know it. But listen, as, as family, as family, being in this relationship with God, here, let me, let me quantify three things. 
Uh, so now I'm in right relationship with it. Here's what salvation produces. Right relationship with God. It gives me an entry to conformity to the image of my elder brother. Be conformed to the image of Christ. That's Romans 8.29 if you take your notes. That's 8.29. 8.29 if you take your notes. Um, um, and Paul in Romans 12 says don't be conformed. One place he says we're being conformed to the image of Christ. In another place he says don't be conformed to this world. Right. Two, two different Greek words for the same word. Two different Greek words. In the 829 passage being conformed to the image of Christ the definition says that we're, we're from the inside out we're being made to look like Jesus. We're being made, listen, 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 listen. We're being made to be Jesus in the earth today. That's a big statement. Some, some people are going to have a lot of trouble with that in, in, in their theology. But that's it's what it means. It's from the inside out. God is at work in our lives. Paul, when he says, don't be conformed to the world, means that something is working against you from the outside in. You get the difference? You get the difference? That the world is always mashing on us and putting us in a position. Listen, you gotta choose this one or that one. You gotta choose sides. You gotta do this. You gotta do that. You gotta believe me and not them. You gotta be left and not right. You gotta be Democrat and not Republican. You gotta be Republican and not Democrat. It's this thing on the outside putting pressure on you to be something that you're not on the inside. Where the work of God is opposite. There's something on the inside working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Are you here? Well, I'm preaching so good. I wish there was a believer in the house. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I don't know. We believe junk more than the word. We believe junk and garbage more than the word. People drop anything in our ear and it land in our heart. And now we're looking at each other cross-eyed and we can't figure out why. Because you believe in folk more than the book. Stop co-signing and start correcting some stuff. Right relationship, conformity to the image of Jesus, and the exercise of delegated authority. That's what salvation brings to us. Right relationship with God, conformity to the image of Jesus, and the exercise of delegated authority. Say anointing. anointing. That's the exercise of delegated authority. Delegated. We have been delegated both authority and power. Exousia and dunamis. We've been delegated that. I, listen, I'm saved and I'm glad, but I ain't thinking about going to hell no more. I'm recognizing that I have an assignment. And if I'm stuck on trying not to go to hell, I'll never step into the assignment. Are you here? Okay, now, now, now we're going to close for real. Did you get Ephesians 2 and 10? Listen to the assignment. Listen. Who has it? Okay, come on, come on, come on. You got to go fast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Oh, so you ain't got to try to come up with no good works. He's prepared them. Amen. They're, they're, they're before you to walk in. You ain't got to try to, well, child, I'm just trying to do my work and make it all. You ain't got to do your work. He got the work there. You just walk in it. I'm looking for something. You ain't got to, you ain't ever got to. Listen, you hear a believer tell you they're looking for something to do. Mm. Mm. Because they're prepared already. They are before. So let me ask you a question. Are you walking in your God-ordained good works? Now, it's not of works unless any man should boast. Now, we've gone back to salvation. Paul talked about that. He was talking about on the issue of salvation. Once you get over the fact that you're saved, then you got some work to do. You can't work for salvation, but after you're saved, there's work to be done. Look at somebody tell them, say, there's work to be done. Let's close, let's close. John 14, 12. Jesus said this, the works that I do, the works that I do, the ones that he will do also, and greater works than these. There's this, 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 
this pericope there. In the pericope, there's this great story, John, John 4, maybe it's 4 through 12 or 8 through 12. And Jesus talks about doing the work. He said, listen, I must work the works of him who sent me while I day. Jesus said, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. This is John 4. And then he talks about the woman at the well and, and, and the disciples and, and all of the work, all of the stuff that happens in John 4. One place in John 4, John 4, Jesus says, Jesus says, you say four months and then the harvest. Jesus says to them, you say four months and then the harvest. You plant and then four months harvest. Jesus said, if you would stop looking down and look up, you'll see the harvest is white right now. Right now. Let me ask, let me ask you, in your situation, what have you been saying? Because oftentimes in your situation, you'll put on delay what should be manifesting now. In, in, oh Lord, help me. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt this story, but chase a rabbit. This is the last rabbit, okay? Maybe it's Exodus. In Exodus, remember the plagues? Remember the plagues? Remember the plague of the frogs? Remember the frogs? And so the frogs everywhere. Frogs. Egypt was thick with frogs. They were everywhere. They were everywhere. John Brown frogs. You open the oven, frogs jump out. You open the refrigerator, frogs. You know, how in the world did frogs get in? You pull the covers back on the bed, ribbit, there's frogs. They were every, well, I'm telling you, they were everywhere. They were everywhere. But Pharaoh says, get, get, get Moses in here. Moses comes in. Pharaoh says, listen, you, this is it. Y'all, the, the, the frogs got to go. Okay, Moses says, okay. Pharaoh says, pray to your God, get rid of these frogs. Moses said, when do you want them gone? Pharaoh said, tomorrow. Make that make sense. Read it. It's in your Bible. Pharaoh said tomorrow. What's the sense in that? Why not? What are you putting off until tomorrow that you should have today? You preach it, Bill. <laughs> saying to God tomorrow, 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 in four months, in four months. In Amos chapter 9, God said, I'll, I'll, I'll bless you with an accelerated anointing so that the one who is planting will pass the reaper in the same field. I'll accelerate seed time and harvest for you. And you are settling for tomorrow when you can be delivered today. Your situation can be the better, better today. And you said, God said, when you want it, oh, tomorrow's fine. It ain't bothering you. You like frog legs. <laughs> Moses said, when you want them gone, Pharaoh said, tomorrow. What's wrong with us? That's the last rabbit. That rabbit was brought to you by New Bethel Community Church. That's the last rabbit. That's the last rabbit. <laughs> Jesus said, greater works, greater works to do. Are you ready? Are you ready to step into greater works? Are you ready to do greater? Are you ready to do more? Are you ready to be more? Are you ready to say more? Are you ready to have more? Are you ready? Are you ready for more? Let me somebody ask yourself, are you ready for more? John 20, 21. John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. That's what Jesus said. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now, we don't have the time to do the exegetical work on how the Father sent Jesus, but it was powerful. It is magnanimous. There, there, there wasn't anything that Jesus lacked. There wasn't anything that he wanted. There wasn't anything that he could do within the confines of his assignment. That's how the Father sent him. Jesus said, just as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Within the confines of your assignment, there isn't anything you can't do. Nothing you can't accomplish. There is no lack. There is no want. Just flow in your assignment and watch God work on your behalf. Same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your body. Look at somebody and say, same anointing. Same anointing. We don't believe it. We don't believe it. We watch some young people come in here on Tuesday. And uh, and um, praying, carrying on, 
doing all the wonderful kingdom stuff they were doing. I was celebrating them. I was so happy um, to see that, witness that. And, um, and to me, as, as, a, as a spiritual father, and for me, as, as a father in our region, and, and they told you who I was. I'm not telling you who I They They told you. The, the, the Collins told you. And, and, um, and as it relates to, to my, res my regional responsibility as a gatekeeper and all of the things that, that, that fall under the purview of my assignment in this, re in this region, I, I looked at some people. I, I grabbed Sister Tony and said, come on, let's stop praying for these young people. Because they didn't just come to give. They came to, are you good? Are you, you follow? You follow? And, I, and listen, and I know my assignment. I know my assignment. And because of your association to me, I got a bit of an insight on your assignment. Now, you may not believe it. You may not like it. But you ain't got to like it or believe it. But I wish you would be obedient to it. And you'll see, you'll step into something that you would not have been in otherwise. I'm trying to help. Does anybody understand that? Y'all understand my heart as I say that, right? I'm sorry, I'm walking up on the camera and everything else. Like, HD is a mean thing when you watch this thing on, on, the, on the playbacks. And, you know, you, you got to have your makeup right. That's a swing and a miss for me. <laughs> it just shows up everything. Um, but I, but I begin. I, I told. I said, Pastor George, get your partner, and and then Pastor George and and and, and Pastor Jay and Pastor Craig. They they got together, and I'm watching them minister to people, and I'm I'm across the room, and I'm feeling the floor reverberate from the power in that trio blessing people. And then they prayed for one of the local pastors, and after the pastor said, "Where you get them guys?" He said. What happened? He said to me, he said, no, no. He said, what happened to Jason? He said, what happened to Jason? I said, listen, this is how we do it here. Amen. This is how we flow. Amen. Yeah, no, how they say this. This is how we get down. This is how we get down. And they, I mean, they, was, they were just standing there praying, Lord, bless them, and give them a, a less bumpy flight back to California, and let everything be well and ready when they find it. No, they were prophesying the word of the Lord over people's lives. And I'm hearing Jay say, and God said, and thus says the Lord. And I'm like, oh yeah, release that word. But I, you know, when they got finished, I wanted to run over and pray. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Lay your hands on me. Pray for me. That's the assignment. You can't step into that if you're worried about missing hell. That's a, that's a two-piece meal. Are you good? Yeah. It ain't about, it ain't about, that's the, I, ain't, I ain't going to hell. I told you I ain't going for you, I ain't going for nobody, I ain't going over my mess. I'm not going to hell. No, I'm, I'm fixated on being a son. Amen. I'm fixated on being a son of God. I'm fixated on the fact that as the Father sent Jesus, Jesus has sent me. And not just me alone. He's sending each and every one of us. Now, oh boy. Did I say that was the last record? That was the last record. What time is it? We got time. We gotta go. Somebody said we got time? I believe you. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I heard it. I thought I heard somebody say we got time. You know that the word apostle is not a Jewish word. It's a Greek word. It's a Greek word. Different culture. Different culture. And it's a word that really springs out of um, war. You know the phrase, to the victor goes the spoils? Right? And so this word apostle, it, it functions like this. When the king would rise up and take his army into battle against another nation, another kingdom, and they would defeat that nation, defeat that kingdom. They would carry off, bring back to the winning land, the who's who of the defeated place. But then the king 
would send and release an envoy who would be led by a person called an apostle, someone who is sent from, from the winning kingdom to the defeated kingdom. The apostle would lead a group of people into the defeated place and the assignment is to make the defeated place as much like home as absolutely possible. Why? Because the king is coming. <clears throat> Clicking, jiving, making sense. Matthew 6.10, thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you see what your assignment is now? It's not just to pray that prayer, but it's to prep this place for the coming of the king. Now, don't leave out here and say, Pastor Bill said, I'm an apostle. <laughs> no, I didn't. I'm telling you the origin of the word and how it's used. And I, I'm pointing to the assignment, not the function, which we use as a title. Mm. Help us, Jesus. So we're titled and no function. Make that make sense. That's the role of, of that apostolic team, that apostolic anointing. They go to the place conquered and they make it look like, feel like, sound like. I mean, from education to food to clothing, they change the culture. So that when the king comes, he feels right at home. Let me ask you this now, and I'll let you go, I promise. Does the king feel at home in the places you go? Does the king feel at home when you're the, with the people you're around? Does the king feel at home? That's something to think about. Because that really defines how we're doing as it relates to the assignment. Okay? My salvation is more than fire insurance. It reunites me with my Father. I stand before Him, not in my own righteousness, but in the righteousness of my elder brother. And then the father sees me as a son. And then my elder brother sends me as the father sent him. And we make wherever we are fit for king and kingdom. I repented. I asked the Lord to forgive me. Because my first answer was I ain't going to hell. My first answer should have been in regards to my assignment. I'm grateful for my salvation. Um, but like love, gratitude looks like something. And so now I think about Jesus at age 12 saying to Mary and Joseph, don't you know it's time for me to be about my father's business. It's time for us to be about the father's business. Staying out of hell ain't it. That's done. That's done. Ministering to people. That's the issue. Listen, yep. Food for the hungry. Water for the thirsty. Clothing for the naked. But healing for the sick. Deliverance for the bound. Right? It's all of that. It's all of that. That's the assignment. And so, I, listen, let's step into that. Let's step into that and step out of some of this other stuff. That is, a, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad, I can, I'm glad that the hell ain't there because parking lot words just be rising up. See, heal them, Jesus, heal them, heal them. It's rising up in me. It's not about that other stuff. Stop letting people reduce you to their petty foolishness. 
I said that. Anybody don't like it? I was, like I said, I'm here all week. Let's talk. Let's talk. But you better wear your grown folks clothes. Because we don't have a grown folks conversation. Yeah. So this stuff is just <laughs> foolishness. And we fall prey to the enemy. And we know it's his trick. We know it's his device. And he gets us every time. What's that girl saying that song? Oops, I done done it again. Or whatever that song is. Y'all know that song. Come on, let's stand in the presence of the Lord. Y'all know which song I'm talking about. How many times you gonna done it again? 